Hello students, Dr. D.A. again. This is our introduction to experiment six in your lab manuals, finding the molar mass of an unknown volatile liquid. Please be mindful that uh, although you have your lab manual procedures, we are making some changes. And so after you've seen this video and the procedures video, when you write your pre-lab outline, you will have to adapt it to these revised procedures. We have studied several methods for finding the molar masses of different kinds of substances. We found that by having the molar mass in conjunction with the composition analysis of a compound, we can derive what its chemical formula is. For gases, if we have a known mass occupying a certain volume at a certain pressure and temperature, we can use the ideal gas law to calculate the molar mass of this gas. If we also have a way of comparing the different rates of effusion or diffusion of two gases, one known, one unknown, we can use Graham's law to find out the molar mass of our unknown. With acids and metals, we utilized chemical methods to find the equivalent masses of each. This was basically finding the number of grams that it takes for a particular substance to execute a particular chemical activity. And with other information, we can take the equivalent mass of an acid or the equivalent mass of a metal with its reaction with acid and find out what their molar mass is. What about liquids? This is gonna be the subject of this week's experiment. This technique was developed actually in 1826 by Jean-Baptiste Dumas. And because of that, we call it the Dumas method. We call this sometimes a Dumas experiment. Here are some diagrams of the original sketches drawn by Dumas back in 1826. Uh, normally, if we were doing this in the lab, we would have some uh, Dumas bulb flasks, uh, the kind of like bulb shape you see there, submerging water using hot plates. However, in the absence of that, we're gonna assume that we're gonna use regular Erlenmeyer flasks. This is a sketch of the procedure. You will have a video that you'll see where they describe it in more detail, but essentially you will start by weighting an empty flask with its covering, whatever that is going to be. We are gonna add an excess of a volatile liquid. By excess, we mean more substance in liquid than will take to fill up the whole flask once it vaporizes. We're gonna submerge the flask covered with a small opening on the top of the covering inside a boiling water bath whose temperature we can actually measure. As the liquid vaporizes, it will push air out of the flask. Some of the vapor will actually escape by effusion through that narrow opening until the pressure equalizes inside and outside. And all that remains inside the flask is the vaporized residual liquid. We will then let it condense back to liquid and wait what is the residual liquid in there, which should be equivalent to whatever the vapor was when it was all vaporized. So let's think about the strategy here. At the point where all of the liquid has vaporized, what we're gonna have is a flask that is filled with pure vapor from the vaporized liquid. In other words, the volume of our gas is whatever the volume of the flask is because it's completely occupied. When the liquid began to vaporize, it initially pushes the air out of the flask. Some of the vapor will actually escape by effusion until the pressure of the vapor inside the flask equalizes the pressure of the atmosphere on the outside. Since we can measure the pressure of the atmosphere with a barometer, at this point, the pressure of the gas equals the pressure on the outside. We can measure the temperature of the boiling water. And because the flask does not have any insulation in it, it'll allow balanced heat exchange. And so the temperature of the water should be the same as the temperature of the vapor inside. So the temperature of the gas equals the temperature of the water. After we have removed the flask from the hot water and allowed it to cool, the vapor will recondense. 
air will push its way back into the flask. But what is important is that the recondensed liquid now represents the amount that was in vapor form before the recondensation. Because we know the initial mass of the empty flask, and now we know the mass of the flask plus this recondensed liquid, we can calculate what was the mass of the vapor. We have the values of temperature, pressure, and volume of the vapor. We can use the ideal gas equation to calculate how many moles of gas were in the flask when the liquid was vaporized. And since that same amount of vapor is now recondensed and we have the mass, we can calculate the molar mass by dividing the mass of the vapor by the number of moles. So that's the general strategy. Uh, you will now be directed to watch a video so you can see how the procedure is carried out. And then later on, we'll come back and we'll walk you through a sample set of calculations. I'll see you soon.